recent election in the, uh, it was decided by the Central Committee of the Republican Party. It was uh, somewhat contentious, but um, the person that I supported, as it turns out, got the job. So I'm, I'm very pleased to announce our newest county commissioner, John Pleshnik, and uh, he's going to talk to us about his vision for the future of Lake County and also things that we can do as citizens to defend ourselves against encroaching government because ESG and other things are coming our way. So, Mr. Plesnick. Thank you, Tom. First, let me say really thank you to Tom Hack because in the last year, year and a half, he hasn't just led the Lake County Liber Liberty Coalition to new heights. And when I see a crowd this big for one of our meetings in a basement, I see, ironically enough, in the basement, new heights. I mean, this is a heck this is a heck of a turnout, and I see some faces here I've never seen at a Liberty Coalition event before, but who I know personally. I see a lot of faces I've never met before, and that's exciting because Tom has really brought us together, and that's what real leaders do. He's not just a school member for school board member for Riverside, where he has been the conservative voice, fought against tax increases, balanced the budget. He's also really emerged as a statewide leader with Free Ohio Now. At some point, I may be introducing our next governor or senator, Tom Hack. Who knows? And I'd say I wouldn't be here without you, but I'd really have to say I literally wouldn't be here without you, without my fellow members of the Lake County Liberty Coalition, because so many of you in this crowd, like Nina Sarar, like Carolyn Fidanza, like Siobhan, Siobhan Justin, uh, you voted for me. You literally gave me the opportunity by exercising your rights and democracy in this republic, and I am extraordinarily grateful to each and every one of you for giving me the chance to serve because we can't let the story end here. <laughs> the story cannot end November of the worst year ever and say that was America, it used to be pretty good. No. I remember the last time that Republicans lost the White House, the House, and the Senate. It was a pretty bleak year. It was 2008. And we're going to talk about what happened two years later tonight. But to get there, I really want to give you a sense of who I am, because you can't see the future without understanding the past. That's why Liberty Camp is such an exciting thing. We can't have an idea of what future we want without understanding our past and our history. And I want, I want you to get to know me just a little bit better because you'll have a sense of what my priorities are and how to hold me accountable. <laughs> and I could be hard to rein in, which is usually a good thing. But when you talk about social credit scores, I think that my grandfather, John Plechnik, and yes, my family's very creative. I am John, son of John, son of John. The oldest son is always named Plechnik. And my grandfather was the mayor of a little village, about 500 people, Hotetershitsa, Slovenia. And instead of having a fancy cell phone to keep track of people, they had someone standing outside the church to make a note of everyone who was in attendance. And they took stock of who was the capitalist, who was the politician. And my grandfather had three strikes against him. He went to church, he owned a little lumber mill, and he was the mayor. And they put him on a death list. But I'd say as luck would have it, but I'd really say, by God's grace, the person the Communist Party sent to assassinate Mayor Plechnik was his sister, excuse me, was his wife's brother, his brother-in-law. And he said, well, I'm not a monster. I'm not going to kill my wife and her family, but understand a mistake like this won't happen twice. This is your last warning. Get out now. And so that's why I'm here in the United States of America. And in the greater Cleveland area, Northeast Ohio, because my family had to come here. It was leave or be killed. Our social credit score was like negative 585,000. That's when they come after to actually kill you. And that's a pall that's always hung over my family. We understand what communism is. When I got to go back to Slovenia to actually see the village that my grandfather help to govern, to see the house that they fled. It was like looking at one of those homes in Pompeii 
or after a nuclear explosion because nothing was out of place. Nothing was moved. The pictures are still on the wall. It's like the family just left and the years went by. It was something to see. No one's really ever touched that house. One of my uncles put in some new windows so that there wouldn't be water damage. But aside from that, it just stood there since they had to leave. Well, folks, there is no United States Part 2 that we can all go running to if this experiment fails. There was only ever one United States of America, and that's why I'm so passionate about what came after 2008 and what has to come after 2020, because the story cannot end here. There has to be something better. But I do believe, and let me say these two words again, by God's grace, that we will get there. I had a conversation with one state central committee person as we were talking about the opportunity to run for commissioner. And she was more interested in talking about the presidential election that had just happened. And she said, I just don't see how we can fix this. I don't see how you or I or even the whole state of Ohio can fix it because we voted for President Trump. I said, you might be right. This problem could be bigger than you or than me or than all of us in this whole state put together. I said, but let me ask you one question. Do you believe God is big enough to fix this? Well, she said the same. Amen. Sometimes it's hard to see how we can win, how any one of us can, or even all of us in this room, although it's encouraging to see so many patriots come together on a Sunday evening. It is. And I think it shows an underlying excitement that goes well beyond this room, than Kirtland, than Lake County, than Ohio. I think that a lot of people are waking up for the first time. But all of us put together aren't enough. We do need God's help. And I believe we have God's help because we're not talking about a selfish political endeavor. No one's saying, I want to run for governor or Senate, please vote for me. We're talking about how to take our country back. And most of us in this room would probably be fine even if we continued this downward spiral. But what about your kids? What about your grandkids? What about their children? We've been trusted with something very special. And whether I hold the torch of county commissioner for two years, whether Siobhan holds Republican County Central Committee for the Republican Party for two years, or for a hundred, no matter how long we're given this, for a year, two years, three years, ten years, we have to pass it on to someone else. We can't be the last one in this job. We can't say, well, it was a good gig while we had it. The country was pretty good. Oh, well, it didn't work out. There will never be another America. So we have to preserve the one we've been given. So my start was in my family coming here, seeing the danger of communism. My father applied for professorships after he got a master's at Ohio State and a PhD from Marquette, small Catholic school in Wisconsin, and he had one offer from one little college right outside Charlotte, North Carolina, called Belmont Abbey. So I was born and raised there. But every wedding, Christmas, funeral, family vacation, and summer, we came right back up to Willoughby Hills in Cleveland and Northeast Ohio, because that's where my father's family was. And so a lot of people think that I grew up here, but I always remind them you only saw me during the summers. <laughs> I was actually homeschooled down in North Carolina, which was a real blessing. My parents were able to give special guidance to me, and my mother actually, my father was a college professor, my mother specialized in education of the blind and the deaf. And so I can hear okay, although some people say that I don't listen when they spout a bunch of liberalism. I don't seem to hear that. And I'm not all that blind. I can see okay with the glasses. So I was an extraordinary student by my mother's standards. I'm not blind. I'm not deaf. This is easy. I can teach this guy. <clears throat> I went to my father's college. My mother homeschooled all of us, all seven of me and my brothers and sisters, all the way. And then I went to college, starting at the age of 15, graduating at 19. One of my sisters and I were co-valedictorians, the first time they ever split the honor at the college. And then I went from there to Duke University School of Law. And that's where I first met liberals. It was an interesting experience, I have to say. There actually are atheists. There actually are people who believe these crazy things you see on CNN and MSNBC. But I will tell you from personal experience, it's because they don't know any better. Conservatives are forced to confront liberalism 
at so many junctures of life, whether you want to or not. We talked about higher education. Try going to college without experiencing at least one liberal Democrat professor, even at a conservative school like Bellman Abbey. But go to a university like Duke. That's when you're going to start to see some real liberalism. There was actually a ranking of law schools when I was there based on how big the campaign contributions were to Republicans versus Democrats. And Duke and Yale tied number one for most liberal when I was there. So I definitely saw, I definitely saw liberalism up close and personal. And I still remember debating with one of my classmates from Berkeley. Yeah, that's cool. <clears throat> and he said, let's talk about abortion. I know you're against it. I'm for it. Let's talk about it. I want to understand your position. I said, well, it really comes down to whether or not you believe that that's a human life. And he recoiled. He said, I thought it was about oppressing women. People actually believe that that's, that's a child? I'm like, no one ever, no one ever expressed this to you. No. He was shocked. I don't know if I changed his mind that day, but I opened his eyes to a view that he had never even considered. And you think it's a joke. You're like, that person couldn't possibly have been so naive. But let me tell you right now, there is no conservative venue where they are forced to hear our point of view. We go through it over and over again. You turn on the TV, you go to school, you walk into your public library, you listen to the radio, bang, bang, bang. You hear their side of things. They never hear yours. And a very conservative student come to me this semester, a little bit depressed, and he's like, I just don't know what what difference I can make. All of society seems to be so opposed to everything I am. Is there a chance? And I said, number one, you're still standing here, which shows that there is. Number two, you're getting something valuable from what better word than persecution. You understand their point of view. You understand who they are and what they represent. They don't understand you. They don't understand anyone in this audience. They don't understand your sincerity. They don't understand your intellect. They don't understand your faith. They just assume you have a ridiculous reason for your beliefs. And that's a huge weakness. It's why they didn't see us coming in 2010. And it's why they certainly don't see us coming now. They don't think there's a basement filled with people talking politics on a Sunday evening. They think everybody's just watching a movie, going to bed early some sitcom. They don't understand it because they've never had to see the other perspective. So while I certainly think we need reform in higher education and we have to have more balance, I will say the silver lining we've been given is that every conservative understands the liberal mind when the liberal has a mind. I'm not sure about some presidents, but <laughs> but they don't understand us. And it's a big political disadvantage. So I came through law school, and I wrote a lot of op-eds, a lot of columns. You can still find most of them today. If you want to know if I'm pro-life, you can find out my position when I was 21. But I'd say my most interesting moment was when I was walking home from class because I didn't have a car in law school. I would walk from my apartment to school and back. I was walking home, my, my little flip phone, remember those, started to buzz, 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 call after call after call. And they said, oh, my God, you're on Rush Limbaugh. You need to turn on the radio now. It's like I'm not in a car. I don't, I don't have a car. I'm, I'm walking down the street. Well, turn on a radio. I don't have one. Well, as it turns out, this was the day that Terry Schiavo died. Remember when they pulled the plug? And Rush Limbaugh was doing a marathon of every column on judicial activism that he could find. And he pulled mine, and he read the whole thing. Now, I later heard a recording, and I'll never forget hearing him say, rest his soul, John Pletchnik is a 21-year-old law student from Duke University, and he's written a column about the usurpation of power by judges. And he read the whole thing with only one change. He said, Ninth Circus Court of Appeals instead of Circuit. He added that little touch himself. And I can tell you, that's probably why I was voted most conservative in my class, although I didn't have a lot of competition for that one. <laughs> so I graduated from Duke Law with honors, and I went to New York City because it provided the opportunity for me to get a Master of Laws in Taxation. 
at New York University, which is the top-ranked graduate tax program. And I know that doesn't sound all that exciting. But to a tax lawyer, the top-ranked graduate tax program, the oldest graduate tax program, it was a big career opportunity. It was a big notch for the resume, and my law firm would pay for it. So I went to New York for a few years to earn that degree. And then, as luck would have it, my old tax professor, who was the only Republican on the faculty, there's something about us tax professors. I don't know what to tell you. I called him up because I wanted to be a professor too. And I said, what can I do? How can I get there? He said, well, your best bet is to clerk, is to work for a federal judge for a few years. I said, well, I happen to know a few of your students have become federal judges. Could you call one? He's like, well, one is on the tax court of the United States. I could give him a call. A week later, he calls back and says, bad news. He's hired people out forever. You'll never get a clerkship with him. But good news. President George W. Bush has nominated another one of my students, and I can get you an interview with him. So I ended up the very first attorney advisor to Judge David Gustafson of the United States Tax Court. When every Republican was leaving D.C. in droves, this was 2008, I was going to D.C. I used to joke that I was Charlton Heston shaking my fist at the sky saying, you damn dirty Democrats, you destroyed it all. I was the only Republican left. It's how it felt going to D.C. then. So I understand that this moment in time after 2020, many of us are asking, what can we do? Is there a future? That's how I think a lot of us felt. It's how I felt as a, you know, immediate past college Republican. You know, is there a future for this party? Can we come back? Can we take our government back? But two short years later, the Republican Revolution of 2010, the Tea Party, we would literally not be here but for the Tea Party movement that began in 2010 over a decade ago. And we took back the Senate, we took back the House, and we never looked back. And everyone knew that we were going to have a Republican president soon because we laid the groundwork. It's tough to have a Democrat as President of the United States, as Speaker of the House, as President of the Senate. But sometimes the only way the average American who doesn't spend their time at a political group or a liberty camp self-educating can learn the dangers of communism, socialism, and Democrats is by letting a few of them be in charge for a while. Everybody thought that Trump and Biden were like, do you want Coke or Pepsi? I wonder who will win the Super Bowl. This is exciting. Won't impact my life at all. Still have the same low taxes, great economy, respect in the world. We might have a little less Twitter fights. That'll be good, too. No. Actually, the only reason you had those low taxes, that economy, and that freedom is because we had a president who might not have always said the right thing, but did the right thing. And I want to ask you something. Would you rather have a politician who tells you whatever you want to hear with a silver tongue or someone who does the right thing? I think the latter is a lot more appealing to me. Latter is a lot more appealing to me. So fast forward a little bit. I apply for professorships. And all my friends are telling me, you don't have a chance. You're a white male Christian conservative. And I Google you, and the first thing that comes up is an article from Rush Limbaugh. Just, there's no chance. Why would you even waste your time applying for professorships? I said, because I'm really passionate about it. You only live once and I want to give it my best shot. And if it's a flight of fancy, oh well. So I applied to every law school in the country, and I heard back from quite a few of them. As luck would have it, people need tax professors. Someone's got to understand the nitty gritty of public policy and the dollars and cents of how it works. And so I got quite a few interviews. But that's when I saw the discrimination, the only form of legal discrimination that's left up close and personal. Still remember interviewing with the University of Kentucky and a young white professor who majored in African American studies at Princeton had the nerve to tell me that he'd read my article, read over Rush Limbaugh, and that my vile views made me completely ineligible to ever talk to or interact with other human beings again. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young Professor. It's very nice to hear your refreshing tolerance of my viewpoints. I remember Albany. 
I gave my talk on inflation and the dangers of inflation, I think all the more timely today. Got a round of applause, standing ovation. But an hour later, I was tapped on the shoulder by an older professor, and she said, we Googled you. You're Republican. It's over. I personally don't think that's fair, but it's just the way the world works. So when people talk about implicit bias, subconscious discrimination, okay, those are bad things. But until you've experienced the real thing, in your face, up front, completely open discrimination, you don't really know the meaning of the word. It's one thing to feel like, mm, maybe I got a bad shake, maybe the reason I didn't, mm, that's one thing. When your government says, I'm coming to kill you, when an employer says, I won't hire you because of your views, you have been discriminated against. And we do need to do more about absolutely saying no to this misbehavior because the further down the road you go, the harder it is to come back. But against all odds, Cleveland State University did hire me. And I know for a fact that they saw me coming because one of the professors said to me, it looks like we might be getting a bit of a conservative firebrand here. So I knew they knew. I never hit it. And despite the fact I was one of only two Republicans on the faculty after being hired, they still unanimously voted to tenure me. They respected my research, my scholarship, my writing, and my teaching. And I give all the credit in the world to my liberal friends and the faculty for evaluating me on my merit as opposed to my political beliefs. Because if they were voting Republican versus Democrat, Democrat versus Republican, I wouldn't have lasted very long. So Cleveland State, I think, truly is a better institution than most public institutions, private institutions, and academia out there today. But nonetheless, if you looked at any institution and said, it's only 2% it's only anything, 2% Hispanic, 2% African American, you'd say, that looks like some kind of invidious discrimination. Well, you know, two out of 50 Republicans, 4%, that, that, that's a little concerning. If you, you put any other label on it other than conservative Republican, you'd say that looks like discrimination. Because it is. <laughs> you never get to that odd a ratio innocently. So even though I think Cleveland State is up there probably in the top 1% of tolerant universities, we're nowhere near far enough. We need to do better. And I would say with respect to Senator Serino's bill, I'd like to see it made a lot more conservative. Rather than talking about free tuition payments for people who drop out, eh, not such a good idea. We need to talk about property tax reform where community colleges can raise your taxes without any oversight. We need to talk about having quotas for conservative professors and penalties for saying to someone, I'm not going to hire you because you're a Republican or you're a conservative. That's where we can really reform higher education. So we need to tighten that bill up and make it a lot more conservative and actually move the needle. The day's over to just say free speech. Free speech without punishment for actually discriminating against it doesn't work, doesn't hold up. There needs to be serious consequences when someone says we're not going to hire you because you're conservative or Republican or you voted for Donald J. Trump. There needs to be serious consequences for that. When people are saying we're going to remember these conservatives like AOC and go after them, there needs to be serious consequences for that. So I became a professor. I was really excited. Great students, great experience, and a chance to mentor a lot of people. And as I look at our Republican Central Committee today and I see folks like Matt Hebebrand, who now I can say Matt Hebebrand Esquire, great young conservatives who are active in our party that I had a role in bringing up, there's nothing more, there's nothing more special than that. There's no greater honor for a professor. But I still remember my first year in Willoughby Hills getting a flyer about how my taxes need to go up, otherwise my house will burn down funny how they always have some extreme. It's for the children. You'll die if you don't vote for this. There's always an extreme reason for why we need to raise taxes. And don't get me wrong, I'm a big supporter of our safety forces. Roads, police, and fire, those are the most important things that any city does. So I have a real sympathy when I'm told we need more support for our police and for our firefighters. He said, we're going to raise taxes by half a percent 
generate a million dollars just for police and fire. You know what those sons of guns did? Yes, the million dollars all went to the police and fire departments. But just like they did with the gambling money, they then cut the general fund subsidy by even more than the million dollars. So that same year they raised taxes by a million bucks in Willoughby Hills, they slashed the budget to the police and fire departments. That's what liberals do. They raise taxes, and then they take even more of the money for themselves. When I saw the waste in Willoughby Hills, I thought about going to a council meeting, but I saw the way they yelled at residents who would come up and disagree. And I realized the only way they take me seriously is if I was sitting next to them. Just like Tom Hack sits with his four colleagues on the Riverside School Board. I knew if I wasn't there next to them, they wouldn't hear my voice. So I ran for council. The mayor ran his best friend against me. I still remember him laughing about how I was young and I didn't realize I had no chance. Well, I didn't realize I had no chance. I didn't realize that for so long I won. The next time around, the mayor found another one of his friends to run against me and I won by even more. And the last time I ran for council, the mayor ran his secretary against me. I beat her too. The bottom line is, even though I didn't have the most money, the most support, the most endorsements, people could hear. They could hear that I meant what I was saying. And when I actually was elected, I voted the way I said I would, which is, as I've learned, rarer than I thought. I really didn't think it was that ambitious to say I'd like to balance the budget and follow the law. It's about my only agenda. <laughs> but to balance the budget without raising taxes, cut them whenever possible, and follow the law. Turns out that was actually a radical agenda. No one had ever heard of that before. Not spend more than you take in. By the way, one trick that a lot of municipalities use in Ohio is they say, well, under Ohio law, we have to balance our budget. But what they don't tell you is that borrowing money is defined as balancing the budget. <laughs> so they say, I balanced the budget again. Amazing work. It's like, yeah, you, you spent a million more than you took in and you borrowed a million dollars. That might be legally balancing the budget, but it doesn't cut it for me. Well, I had the opportunity last year to run for Republican State Central Committee across three counties. But I wasn't sure I was going to do it because I knew that a good friend was thinking about it too. And I asked Tom Hack what he thought because Tom was that friend. And he said, not only will I support you, I'll endorse you. And I can honestly say that I wouldn't have had the political juice to go for this appointment for commissioner if I hadn't just won a, Repu a Republican primary across three counties with over 60% of the vote. And having won that primary with over 70% of the vote in a three-way race in Lake County. They knew they couldn't take me. The better candidates, the bigger, scarier fish knew they couldn't take me in a primary. And they didn't want to go into an appointments battle where the voters are even more conservative. And so we were able to win, not by a little, with about 60% of the Republican precinct committee. And I certainly would not have won without the votes in this room and without Tom Hack's support. So I want to say thank you again and a round of applause for the honorable, the inexorable Tom Hack. As Tom said, this organization has always been mostly about education. But we have to take it another step. Because if all the elected officials are only paying lip service to our conservative values, nothing will change even when we win elections. We need to elect people in this room. We need to support people in this room. Because we know from years of working together and volunteering with each other where we stand. You don't have to ask if Tom Hack is conservative or if this is an act. If this is an act, he's been doing it very well for a long time, and he's about to win an Oscar. The reality is, if you've worked in the trenches with someone this long, you don't have to ask where their heart's at. You know. And those are the kind of people we need to start supporting. We have to stop compromising, going, well, this will have to do. No, we actually need to run our own people and win. And I'm proud to be, at least the first in memory, the first member of the Liberty Coalition, the Tea Party, to win a seat on the county commission. And let me tell you right now, 
They fought me so hard because they know that once I got in, they were going to have a very hard time getting rid of me. Liberal Democrats know that once people see the governance, the fiscal conservatism, the benefits that it brings, they won't want to give it up. Oh, we have to raise taxes. There's no other way. We can't balance the budget. It's impossible. Then this guy comes in and does it. Man, they look bad. That's what they said in Willoughby Hills. There's no way to balance the budget without raising taxes. We have to triple your sewer fees. You have to pay three times more than the people in Kirtland or Wycliffe. It's the only way. Well, I looked at the numbers and said, hmm, number one, you didn't do... You didn't do a fee study, which almost everyone does before they raise sewer fees. Number two, you, you basically tripled them, uh, which is remarkable. And why is it we have to pay two or three times more than any other municipality in Lake County? They didn't like those questions. And when I cut sewer fees back down, for some reason, the sewer fund didn't bankrupt or expire as they predicted. In fact, there's more money in the sewer fund today than there was then. What they were doing is they were using sewer fees to pay for salaries. They were using sewer fees to pay for compensation and bonuses, creative accounting. It wasn't illegal, mind you, but it was wrong. It was wrong. And when conservative Republicans get in office and they prove these myths wrong, it's impossible to balance the budget. We have to borrow more. We have to raise taxes. We make them look bad. And that's why they fight folks like President Donald J. Trump so hard because people notice the difference. And once again, I think there's a real shock factor here. People thought Donald Trump, Joe Biden, vanilla ice cream, strawberry ice cream, you know, they're all ice cream. It doesn't matter. Life will go on. Well, funny how life hasn't gone on. And we're going to see even more radical changes. We're going to have to live with that, but not forever. Because just as we came roaring back in 2010, we're going to come roaring back in 2022. And not because of any politician, because of you. Because some of you are going to run for office. And some of you are going to campaign hard for others who will. And some of you are going to say, I'm willing to be the associate vice president or executive director of Liberty Coalition and keep building. So instead of 50 people, we have 100. We have 200. I've seen the meetings in Portage County with Tom Z. Tom Zawodikowski, and many of you have too. It's not unreasonable to get there. We are going to. We are going to change not just Lake County, not just Ohio. We're going to change the country by doing our part. The patriots in the Revolutionary War weren't all named George Washington. There will be generals, and just like George Washington, they'll emerge by accident of history. But George Washington wouldn't have won if he ran out there with a long sword against the British by himself. The reality of it is it takes a team. It takes people working together, working for their country, not for themselves. Those are foreign concepts to the people at Berkeley and Yale. They think everyone is fundamentally self-interested. No one cares about the greater good. They just say so on TV to get elected. But nobody comes to an event in someone's basement on a Sunday night to listen to a tax professor out of self-interest. Every single person in this room I know cares sincerely about the future of Lake County and Ohio and the United States of America. And we're all going to play a small part. I don't think there are any George Washingtons or Abe Lincolns in this room, but I hope I'm wrong. It would be great. But you know what? None of them would have, none of them would have changed this country alone. And that's the point we need to remember. God will put each of us where we're meant to be. Gave you a long, drawn-out history from Mayor Plechnik, kicked out of Slovenia by communists, to Professor Plechnik getting one offer in North Carolina where his kid, John Plechnik, was born and came back to Ohio for another professorship because inexplicably a liberal university hired him anyway. And because of a resignation, because of 150 people coming together and making a decision, I'm standing in front of you as your Lake County Commissioner, as one of three people. So what's my plan for the future, aside from kicking the Democrats to the curb and taking our government back? Well, in Lake County, there are a couple critical things. If you look at our budget, and that's the first thing a Slovenian does, I looked at the money, you'll see that we spend 
54 to 56 million dollars by direct vote of the commissioners. We call this the inside budget. But the outside budget dwarfs it. We spend over 270 million dollars a year through various boards that the commissioners either appoint in whole or in part. That's where most of the money is actually spent. Now don't get me wrong. I will husband those 50 some million dollars with the greatest care for you. But the vast majority of your tax dollars for the county are spent by the boards that we appoint. So I recognize that one of the most important jobs that I've been entrusted with is to choose leaders. And with a Republican majority on the county commission, we can literally choose those leaders. Lakeland Community College is a great example. They've raised their taxes a few too many times in my view. I really think any reform needs to look to the fact that community colleges don't have to live within their means. Four-year colleges can't raise taxes on you. Community colleges can put a property tax levy on the ballot whenever they want, and they often do. Short of statewide reform, we need trustees who don't spend more than they're taking in and then say, I need to raise taxes to cover my shortfall. We need trustees who do the job and find a way to give affordable tuition without raising taxes. We need trustees who can stand up to administration and say, you know what? There's not enough money for raises this year. Cleveland State didn't give raises this year. Why are you? Hmm? Why are you? Because you know you can go back to the taxpayers whenever you want and ask for more money. Step one is new trustees who understand that we have to live within our means. And I am so proud to tell you that one of the first things I did as your county commissioner is to vote with President John Hammercheck and Commissioner Ron Young to appoint former Councilwoman Jan Micah of Willoughby Hills to the Board of Trustees for Lakeland Community College. And that budget hawk has got to scare every big spender just by hearing her name. Because when they said in Willoughby Hills, if you don't vote for this budget, we'll sue you. If you don't vote for this budget, we'll remove you. If you don't vote for this budget, we'll fire you. Jan said, bring it on. So let me tell you something. That strength, that conservatism is what I'm looking for for that $270 million that's being spent by our boards in Lake County. And if you have interest, let me know because positions keep turning over and turning around. And I have no doubt that we can find a position that fits you because we need conservative leaders who are going to be husbanding those resources. That's a big piece of the pie. I'll also say that we're going to have to be especially fiscally responsible because our jail is falling apart. It's going to have to be replaced in some have to. We're going to have to repair slash rebuild slash build a new jail. The geniuses who built it 35, 40 years ago said, let's put a flat roof on there. What could possibly go wrong in Northeast Ohio with a flat roof? Oh, my gosh. You walk up there and you see. Like, let's use rubber shingles. That's an innovative new concept that never worked before but might work now. <sighs> you see the water damage on your taxpayer dollars running through your plumbing, your walls, your ceilings. It's infuriating. They just burn the money. They burn the money. So number one, we're going to have to work very hard to save enough money to pay for this jail. But number two, when we build it, we need to build one that will be there until everyone in this room is dead. If Seriously, if you're alive, when they say we need to build another jail, you should come with pitchforks and torches after me. Because a public servant should not ask for an investment that large from their community, whether it's a school building or a jail, and then you're alive to hear about it again. How many people live in the Willoughby East Lake Public School District? How many of you are tired of hearing the buildings were built poorly. We need to rebuild them again. Well, that's what you say every 15 or 20 years. There are buildings in Europe that are older than the United States. It can be done, folks. You can build a building that outlasts a generation. You can build a building that outlasts five generations. The technology was there in medieval times. But you know what? Planned obsolescence. If we can build another building and hand out tax dollars to all of our friends and contractors, maybe we get reelected. When we build the next jail for Lake County, we need to build it so that everyone in this room is dead before we have to come back and ask for more money again. 
And so people often say county commissioners are about budgets and buildings. We need to balance our budget both inside with the county commissioners and outside with all the boards. We need conservatives to serve on those boards and to balance those individual budgets. We also need to start building buildings with the idea of them lasting a lifetime, not every 15 or 20 years so that the next politician can get a whole bunch of contributions by building another building and building another building and building another building. It is absurd that we can't seem to build one decent building. And when I saw that flat roof, when I walked up there, I said, they wanted this building to fall apart. They wanted this building to fall apart when they built it. And I don't know who was county commissioner back then. They're probably dead. But if they're not, we should find them. <laughs> we should find them. Because it is absurd that we're paying to do it again. So that is going to be a huge part of the next several years. It's going to be actually trying to build a building that outlasts everybody in this room so that we don't burden the next generation with yet another liability. And then lastly, we have to talk about our role relative to the federal and state government because I know what a lot of us are concerned with. We've seen overreach by the state government, even through Republicans. We've seen in the last few months great overreach from the federal government. And we need to do what we can to limit that damage to Ohio and to Lake County. In some ways, municipalities have more authority than the county does to push back against the state because under our Ohio Constitution, municipalities have home rule. I will say that right's been under attack. And unfortunately, liberal judges have limited and limited and limited home rule in Ohio. Counties are actually extensions of state government. That's the way we're set up. So we're not really in a position to push back against the state because we only exercise the powers granted to us under the Ohio Revised Code. Your state reps and state senators could come together tomorrow and could completely change the county. They could wipe out county government. They could combine all the counties into three mega counties. They could cut us up into ten counties and do whatever they want. Counties are creatures of statute, and they are an extension of state government. But cities, villages, and townships have home rule authority, and they can push back in ways that we can't as long as the courts do their job and recognize that home rule. But even counties, as a part of the state, can invoke the fact that there are states' rights and that the states do have rights under the Constitution vis-a-vis -vis the federal government. So when the, the state government encroaches, counties really aren't in a place to say no because we are an extension of the state. But when the federal government encroaches, the state does have the right to push back. And that falls on every representative of the state, whether it's a senator, a state rep, a county commissioner, a county treasurer, a county auditor. All of us need to do our part and say, both in our official capacity and in whatever voice we're given as somebody who's sometimes recognized, no. We need to say no loudly and proudly. Just like when President John Quincy Adams and a congressman said no one last time before he collapsed on the floor of the House. He was the nephew, by the way, of Sam Adams. Sam's looking pretty good for being several hundred years old, I have to say. But I will never forget when I was still a law student, interning for my very conservative Republican congresswoman, when I got a tour of the U.S. Supreme Court from one of Chief Justice Rehnquist's clerks. And he told me, come on, come on, we're going upstairs. We went into the Chief Justice's office, and he said, sit down on that couch. He said, now no one can ever say that you didn't sit on President John Quincy Adams' deathbed. Because Chief Justice Rehnquist demanded that he have that couch that he collapsed, fell on, died on after he was pulled out from the Capitol building speaking on the floor, speaking his mind as a loud, proud patriot one last time, died on that couch. I got to sit on the couch that President Adams, the sixth president of the United States of America, died on. That's an odd thing to say, but it reminds me of how each and every one of us is connected to that founding moment. When this country was born, it was often said that John Quincy Adams was one of the last links to the revolution because he was a child and saw some of the battles. 
but we're all links back to the revolution because we're the peasants who don't know our place. We're the ones who say, no. We're the ones who say, I have rights. And we're the ones who do more than just say it. We do something about it. And the people in this room, like Tom Hack, have done a lot about it. I'm grateful to be a small part of that. And my main goal as your county commissioner is twofold help in a small way to lead the charge in 2022 so we take our government back just like we did in 2010. Now I'm old enough, a little bit older, that I don't just need to sit on the sidelines like I was in 2008. None of us can afford to be on the sidelines now. And two, I want to use the authority that you've trusted me with to show that there is a better way. Because just as people recoil when they see what a liberal Democrat really means, I think people are shocked in the best possible way when they see what a conservative really means. Oh, so I actually get to keep my money? There are actually jobs being created because people want to be in a low tax rather than a high tax area. This is a better po I get to do whatever I want. I'm free? Oh, that's what this was all about. If we can open just a few more eyes, even with all the voter fraud that happened last year, it was a sliver that separated us from controlling all of Congress and the White House. A sliver. The best cheats in the book. And they still could barely pull it out. What does that mean, folks? It means that it only takes a few eyes open to turn the tragedy of 2020. And 2020 will never be remembered well. No one is going to look back in that year and say, that was a great year. No one. But we can take that tragedy and we can turn it into something great. We can make America great again. Quoting Donald Trump, quoting Ronald Reagan, who are really looking back to the founding fathers who wanted to make the world great again. And it takes that unruly, uppity peasant who says, I'm not willing to bend knee to anyone other than God. And if you try... To make me, God help you, because I won't. Didn't rule that it was unconstitutional to use property taxes to fund schools. They ruled that the formula that was being used was unconstitutional. So there is legislation in the State House right now. Actually, Representative Jamie Callender, who is our representative for this area, is working on it. He would be the person to talk to. But they are not proposals to eliminate the use of property taxes. They're proposals to change the formula. Because the Supreme Court never said property taxes were unconstitutional. I think there are too many property taxes, but that comes back to us. We need to stop saying yes, yes, yes every time. We need to start demanding accountability. And I know that Tom demands it as a school board member, but we need to demand it as citizens. Because we too often just say yes. Because time is short, I'll sum the bill up as exactly what it is. An attempt to have a federal takeover of state elections so that they run the mechanisms. I mean, the people who gave us uh, Arizona and Wisconsin and Michigan want to apply that success to the whole country. That's bad. And we need to push back at every opportunity. And we still, as of today, have a very Republican Supreme Court. And if they push this legislation through, we need to sue.